I need to have a correction added to my jam here. I give an email account for All That and Mo, but it's not correct. The All That and Mo email is allthatandmo at AOL.com because I'm old school like that. And I totally forgot and I said Gmail. It is, in fact, All That and Mo at AOL.com. Okay, now you can listen to the episode safely. This is Melina Lee Williams Haas. I deeply appreciate you listening and taking the time to hang out with me. I will be addressing issues of life, the universe, and everything that are often bogged down and mired in shame and grief, and talk about how they can be repackaged to be useful and gorgeous and fucking awesome for you. So sit back and relax, or you know what? Sit up and freak out. However, you prefer to listen. Let's go. I am recording this currently in Emeryville, California, where I have come in order to go and see the Parable of the Sower tomorrow night at Zellerbach Hall. This is an opera version of an Octavia Butler novel that I haven't read in a million years. I'm going to be honest. I haven't read it since I was in in college, maybe, or immediately after being pushed out of college. But it was very formative in my life because up until that point, I had not read any science fiction by a black woman. And as a massive science fiction nerd, it was unbelievable to me that it had taken that long for me to discover her specifically, but that I can't lay at my own feet entirely. There's only so much one can do when you're put into a vacuum chamber that does everything in its power to erase people who look like you. So I'm really glad to be able to come and see this opera. It is entirely a mess because this past week, as you may know, I had COVID. It was my first time having covid And compared to the stories I heard about the first couple of years of the pandemic, especially before treatments were found, and even thereafter, up until probably about a year or so ago, the stories I was hearing about people getting COVID were absolutely viscerally terrifying to me because I am in several of the categories where you are considered to be high risk. And so I was eligible for the vaccine quite early on because I'm diabetic. That was a comorbidity. Is that the right word? I don't fucking know. Anyway, that was a condition that put you at higher risk for complications from COVID. So one, diabetes. Two, I'm fat. Apparently that also has some impact on your COVID shit. Number three, I am asthmatic. I have asthma. And that's an obvious problem for something that profoundly impacts the respiratory system. And then the last one, which is very interesting, is I have thalassemia, which is something I did not even know until I was, oh God, in my fucking 40s, maybe. And the reason I found that out is because I was weird. I was anemic. And then I was put on a course of iron infusions. It wasn't really helping. And then they did another test and said, actually, you have thalassemia. Why didn't you tell us? And I was like, I don't even know what that is. And then I found out that a thalassemia trait is something that is usually found in cisgender women who are giving birth to babies because they test for it. Because it's a thing you can pass. I don't know, fucking know. Anyway, it's a weird fucking thing. It's usually found in, I think, Mediterranean and people of African descent. And it is not the usual anemia where you have a low number of red blood cells or they are malfunctioning somehow. My red blood cells are just fine. However, they're tiny. Thalassemia trait means that your red blood cells are slightly too small. And so by volume, they're not doing the same amount of work. And I wish to fucking God this was something that we tested for because it would have explained my childhood inability to really do a lot of gym shit. I would just perpetually hit a wall real fast and be like, I'm too, I can't. And it wasn't because I was lazy or a shitty athlete. It was because my body wasn't quite functioning at the top level. So there you have it. So for the first time, when we were first enabled to obtain the vaccine, I ran immediately. I was in, I think, the second wave that they released. 
So I'm fully vaccinated and all of that. What was most interesting to me, though, was a weird side effect. I'm going to assume just of the mental exhaustion, but my anxiety and my fanatophobia, I have a very profound fear of death. Neither of those things bothered me for like a good 10 days. It's starting to creep back now. Not so much the anxiety, but I keep poking the thanatophobia because I can't remember a time when even talking about or thinking about my own death didn't send me into like a massive panic attack and meltdown and or shut down where I just, everything gets cold and dark and I can't think and I can't see and I can't focus and it triggers an anxiety. But that's just not happening. And so I wish to God it would stay. I am very certain it will not. But what a miraculous sort of thing. And it really started me down this rabbit hole of how interconnected our bodies and our minds are. And I was a pervert and as a kinky person, this is something I have definitely explored a great deal in terms of intense sensations, sensations that most people would consider painful rituals and ordeals that are deliberately set up to be difficult or uncomfortable and what the purpose of those things are. Our minds, our brains, and everything else are still made of meat, right? They're still meaty chunks. They're kind of miraculous meaty chunks, but they're just chunks of meat and proteins and fats and all this other shit. And they are energized with all kinds of shit that makes us who we are, right? And I'm not a scientist and I don't speak to any of that, but what I wonder is how much of how we are, who we are, personalities, what percentage of it is impacted by the package of meat that's around the important brain part. Because really all that we are, all that we see, all that we know is completely filtered through our brains and our bodies. It comes to us through a filter. And the idea that a, <laughs> that an illness can impact my psychology is fucking mesmerizing to me. And I know that there's a lot of science around that. And I know that science is starting to understand, for example, that gut health has a lot to do with schizoaffective disorders and schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And all these things are now sort of coming back to what ancient medicines have always said, is that it's all interconnected. It's part of the reason why I'm always fascinated by and swear by acupuncture or some of my medical shit, because it looks at the body as a whole thing. It doesn't pull it apart, right? In Western medicine, I go to seven different specialists for my stuff. I have to see someone for my teeth but not even one person for my teeth. If the outside of my teeth need help, I see one person. If the pockets around the gums of my teeth need help, I see another person. If you have to open the tooth and drill a hole into it, I see yet another person. Now, if the where the tooth is being anchored to my jaw has an issue, that's yet another person. It's so broken up. If I have a problem with my ankle, I might need to see an orthopedic person, but I also might need to see someone because maybe there's muscle damage or tendon damage or nerve damage. And then that's another specialty. It's all broken apart and they don't all work together all the time. It's why there are massive databases, for example, just to make sure that you are not fed different drugs that can fuck up your system. When I went on Paxlovid for my COVID, I had to stop taking two other medications entirely and received a very stern, dire warning about taking one of my asthma medications because it could cause heart damage. Now, if you go to see an acupuncturist, that's not an issue because they're looking at your whole body. They're looking at everything all at once together and saying, this is what we're going to do to help this. And we're going to help this other part along too and try to get your body activated to healing because that's what acupuncture is. It's activating your body to try to do its own thing to heal itself. And I dig that. I respect that. And I truly respect the fact that it allows your brain to be involved in a way that's very active. Sending messages to your brain that's saying, hey, brain, there's a little problem here. Why don't we send some cool cells down there to fix it? And then cool cells run down there and do what the fuck they're supposed to do. I don't even know if any of this is making goddamn sense. I still have that fucking COVID brain. But I think my point was that I am still amazed and bemused at how this illness has shifted my brain in probably a temporary way, but maybe some more permanent ways. And then I start to extrapolate that out to the millions of people 
who have survived bouts of COVID or multiple bouts of COVID, right? Like I've, this is my first time getting it. And that's unusual among the people I know. The majority of people I know have had at least one round of COVID and some still haven't. And I think that probably those are people who may have a built-in immunity, right? That just aren't going to get it in the same way that I, for many, many years, never got the flu until I moved to the Bay Area and the mold spore counts destroyed my fucking immune system, fucked up my upper respiratory system. And then I did get a flu one year and it was horrible. And so I was like, oh yeah, flu shots are a thing. So I got a flu shot and then never got the flu again. So that was that for me. But so much of what we do, so much of who we are is impacted by what our bodies are doing, right? And as a kinky person, I've always felt like a body knot, an astronaut in my own body. Body knot? Now that sounds like I'm tying myself up into knots or perhaps, um, I don't know. That's not a good word. I'll come up with something else. A physical explorer. <laughs> the first few years I was involved in kink and BDSM, I thought I was a masochist, right? When you're trying to figure out who the fuck you are, part of what you have to do is experiment and you have to see if pain is pleasurable to you, at what point does it become not pleasurable anymore? Am I really enjoying this or am I just doing it in order to please someone else? And so the first couple of years I was involved, I was playing, I think almost exclusively the first year or so with one person. And after the first year, I was permitted to play with other people. And so I was able to experiment a bit more. And what I realized, and it took me a few years, and it was not until after I was through my first two relationships, I realized I'm actually not a masochist by definition. A masochist is someone who eroticizes pain, someone for whom pain or intense sensation or sensations of discomfort, emotional, physical, mental, spiritual, is eroticized and pleasurable to them intrinsically. The first time I played with someone towards whom I did not feel any submission, I got very annoyed when I was uncomfortable. And so, as is my right, I would say, hey, you know what, can you adjust that? I'm actually really not enjoying it. It's just, I don't like it. And they would do the right thing and adjust it and, and change their approach and slow their roll and do something a bit different till it was something that was more amenable to me, agreeable to me, and pleasurable for me. Now, for those who aren't familiar, if you are typically in a um, dominant submissive relationship, a master slave relationship, many people who are in submission will do things in order to please their dominant master, owner, partner, etc. And sometimes you will endure these things for their pleasure because you're enduring something for them is what is erotic, right? Like I'm turned on because I'm making you smile, I'm making you laugh, I'm giving you this pleasurable experience tying me up and hitting me with the stick, right? Now, if you are not masochistic, then that's it. You are enduring something for the pleasure of someone else. If you are masochistic, that means that you are also taking pleasure in that pain and that discomfort. But when I bottom to someone towards whom I did not feel submissive, I realized that my pain tolerance was like zero. I was like, don't hit me. Don't touch me. Do nice things. You can pet me. You can put me in rope. You can do, you know, like impact stuff that I like, but don't make it sting. Don't make it hurt in this particular area because I don't like it. And it was something I never even thought about doing when I was submitting to someone. And over the course of the next few years, after my first few relationships, I realized I'm actually not a masochist. I am very submissive to pain if it is someone towards whom I feel a great deal of love and affection. So that was my shtick. And then when I realized that, I was like, oh, okay, great. Awesome. Nice. Thank you. I want to make it clear that these things are not some totals of who you are as a kinky person, right? You can be dominant and masochistic. I know, crazy, right? <laughs> you can be a submissive. You can identify as a submissive or a slave or a sub or a bottom or whatever and be sadistic right? You can be someone who finds pleasure in other people's pain and still also be submissive. These things don't come attached in a string. So I want to enable you to cut and paste your own identity here around these things because all of that is fucking up to you. There are times when I 
feel particularly submissive. There are times when I feel particularly vicious, like biting and scratching and kicking someone else's ass. That does not detract from my role as being the uh, loved and owned property of my dominant slash husband slash master. All of those things are part and parcel of who we are, right? So, for example, we have a, a the spouse meister and I have quote unquote adopted a new member in our little family, our little leather cluster. And she herself, I don't think she identifies as a bottom. I have to check what her actual identity is. But to us, she is the kitten because <laughs> she identifies as a kitty cat and loves to do that sort of persona, fursona, persona thing. And what was really great is that when we were at the South Plains Leather Fest, I was feeling kind of scratchy and bitey. And so we had a whole scene where basically I got to take care of her, but also bite and scratch her, which I very much loved. And of course, this past Meister enjoyed watching that. Does it mean I'm any less submissive? No. Does it mean that I am less of a slave? No. Does it mean that I like causing people intense sensation and seeing their reactions? Yes. And that's actually part of my service because at the end of that scene, I really like the fact that the person I'm playing with is feeling good, is enjoying being in their body in that moment that we share this experience together. And I really like that. There is also a part of me that really likes just watching other people in pain. What's interesting to me is that I feel like the streak of masochism that runs through many societies is very powerful and it's unacknowledged. And there's so many of us who are sadists. If you're sitting there watching a series of fail videos with person after person falling on their ass or face planting or my favorite, the pinnacle, the ultimate, the nutshot compilation. <laughs> I swear to God, I can watch people with balls get smacked in them the limit cannot be defined. Okay. The limit does not exist. <laughs> Fucking I'm serious. I love it. And for so long, I felt kind of bad because people with testicles had told me like all of my life, how delicate they were and how sensitive they were. But every time I was in a situation where I saw someone take a hit to the balls or I myself provided the hit to the balls, I couldn't help but fucking crack the fuck up. I will never forget with my ex-boyfriend, Steve, may he rest in peace. We were laying on the couch one day and I went to get up and I put my elbow right on his fucking balls. And you know how like you just feel the air get sucked out of the room? Because I didn't realize what had happened. Like I didn't realize that I'd hit him in the balls. But like I just went to get on my elbow to get up and all of a sudden there was this shift in the energy of the whole room. And I looked up at him, he's very tall. And at the other end of the couch, his face, and he just like, turned the palest pale, like no color at all in his face. It just grayed out. And there was just this silence. Like he wasn't even, he didn't make any noise. He didn't cry out in pain. There was just this dead vacuum of silence, like time and space had been rent apart and destroyed by some laughing, cackling demon. And he had seen the face of this demon and was just fearing for his entire future. Like that's what it fucking looked like. And then I realized what had happened. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And he just slowly in like the slowest of slow motion curled up into this tiny ball and just laid there on the couch. And I am a compassionate human. I like to think of myself as someone who is empathetic and feels the pain of others. But all I could do in that moment, like I started laughing so hard, it was freakish. Like tears were squirting out of my eyes, like at a 90 degree angle. And I just, then I fell to the floor, like fucking laughing my ass off and screaming. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. At the same time. So like I'm crying and laughing and screaming. Oh my God, Steve, I'm so sorry. <laughs> at the same time as he's just literally laying there. He must have laid there for like five minutes. It was, he told me later, it was really bad. Like I got, you know, some peas out of the freezer to give him. He was like, I think I might throw up. It was super bad. But my first reaction was to crack the fuck up. 
because I'm an evil sadist, apparently, and some sort of deviant sociopath. But the reality is, that's a really human thing. It's not fucking just me, bro. If it were, there would not be nutshot compilations on YouTube with millions of views. There would not be entire Japanese game shows. Okay? Google it. Find that shit, because it's amazing. There would not be entire Japanese game shows dedicated to how many hits to the balls people can take, right? Like, it's that real. (laughs) But the experiments I've done with my body over the years have led me to understand that conditional masochism, as I call it, is something that's actually very common. And a lot of folks who are involved in kink and BDSM don't understand the reasons why they sometimes are feeling very masochistic and other times not. It's because you might not actually be a masochist. It might be dependent on the situation. It might be dependent on who you're playing with. Shit, it might be dependent on how you fucking feel that day, right? There are plenty of people I know who experience chronic pain. And for them, sometimes pain play can actually be something that takes them beyond their own quotidian pain and discomfort. Like in the way that people who have arthritis will sometimes actually rub stinging nettles into their hands, A, because the pain takes them out of the pain of the inflammation, and B, of course, the nettles contain medicine. So so there's that as well. But the main idea being that sometimes pain can be used to combat pain. I know I have definitely used physical pain to combat emotional pain. There's been times when I've been struggling to get through it. And sometimes just a few jolts of physical pain can get me back into my body, myself. This has also changed with age. The older I've gotten, the less I'm interested in pain play, which is something that when I was a a spunky young pervert, I gasped at with terror when the older perverts would be like, yeah, just wait till you hear middle age. Once your knees go out, you're not going to be so spunky about crawling around on the floor, (laughs) begging, begging for forgiveness and mercy from whatever hot dom you're kneeling to. And I was like, no way, I will always be the, and now I'm like 53 and I'm like, "Mm -mm, mm -mm. you better give me like a couple weeks to build up to that shit, senor. I'm not ready. (laughs) So it's very interesting for me to see how our bodies ebb and flow as we get older and as we discover more about ourselves and as we recover from fucking diseases like COVID (sighs) and as our minds and our bodies and our hearts change. I just realized I did this like space out thing as I was trying to think of the next thing I was going to say. And I realized, yeah, you know what? COVID brain is very real. So I am not going to push myself. I'm going to accept the fact that a slightly short episode is still okay in this world. (laughs) I'm going to model positive self-care and give myself a break from feeling like if I don't fucking come at you with a full half hour that I'm somehow lacking and slacking. I'm going to sign off on that for now. I will say also, I want to encourage folks to take a look at my new website, kinkdoula.com, K-I-N-K-D-O-U-L-A.com. I have several retreats coming up in beautiful Scotland and gorgeous England in the countryside. I'll be in Inverness and in a couple of other places. I'm also speaking in London, and I have a couple of dates in Vienna over the summer. I'm putting together a whole fucking European tour, y'all. Well, European and UK tour, since the UK is no longer part of the EU. (laughs) So please check out www or http colon slash slash w whatever the fuck it is kinkdoula.com. Check it out. And my events page, there's also a link at the top where you can click and get on my mailing list. And I strongly advise that you do so because first and foremost, you'll get a free class you can watch. It's me talking shit, which I'm doing it right now. So I don't know if you need more, but if you do need more, (laughs) you can get it that way and you can download it and watch that class. And what else? Yeah. So if you have any questions or stuff that you would like to ask me, why don't you drop me an email? Just made a new email thingy. Send it to all that and mo at AOL.com, the podcast title. 
and be like, hey, Mo, you said this one thing in this one podcast and you said, I should make a podcast about that later. And then I forgot. I, and, I, and I'll always forget. You know why? Because I don't fucking listen to my own goddamn podcast because fuck that. It makes me exhausted. Anyway, so send a note to all that Mo uh, AOL dot com. And let me know if there's something I said before that you'd like me to go deeper in depth into deep, deep, deep dive duck. Or if there's any questions that you have that occur to you, or if you're just like, yeah, I would just like to hear more about blah. Yeah. So that's all I have in me this week. <laughs> Tune in next time for more bullshit. No, it's not more bullshit. Oh, why am I so self-deprecating? <laughs> It's exhausting. Anyway, I love you. And I love me. And we're awesome. You've been listening to All That and Mo. Thanks so much for spending your precious, precious time with me today. My podcast is produced by Cody Crabb. Theme music by Georg Friedrich Haas. As performed by Marcus Weiss. And I look forward to spending time with you again really soon.